Welcome once again to Cinemaholics. I am John Negroni. I am the box office columnist for Adam Tickets, head writer of Cinemaholics.com. And every once in a while, I write a book or two. He is a pop culture writer for Cinema Blend, and he also reviews films for Cinemaholics.com. It's Will Ashton. Hi there, Mr. J. Wow. That was never Miss- again. Never, never again? No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. You have been banned from all voices until Sam comes back. Are you saying the Joker and I are through? Hugh, Hugh and Harley Quinn are through for sure. Will, guess what? What? It's season four of Cinemaholics, Will Ashton. Sound the air horns. There they yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's nuts. Put put that uh put that confetti cannon down, Will Ashton. We have a show <laughs> to get to. Season four begins right now with this episode of Cinemaholics featuring the films Birds of Prey, Horse Girl, Timmy Failure, Mistakes Were Made. And a little spo- a little special mini review for BoJack Horseman season six. It's gonna be a good time. Now you can find more episodes of Cinemaholics, including our full archive on Cinemaholics.com. You can write into the show anytime by sending us a quick, polite, professional email. Please do. Our email is cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support us directly by becoming one of our monthly patrons, check out patreon.com slash cinemaholics. All right, well, just a, just one off topic to get to because we're we're sure. keeping this one lean and mean. Yeah, mean. Yeah. Yep. And we just have to announce, of course, that our Oscars special is out right now. That's right. We did a bonus episode for Oscars 2020. If we picked the winners, because by the time a lot of people are going to be listening to this, mm-hmm. they'll already know the Oscar winners, right? But sure. some people who haven't listened to our episode yet won't know the Cinemaholics winners. Yeah, so we went from having an episode with a shelf life of three days to an episode that has a shelf life of like a week. Yeah, which that's about <laughs> our, our groove, I would say. Yeah, But yeah, so you can find that right now in your podcast feed or on Cinemaholics.com. And with that, let's jump right into our reviews for this week, starting with the big one, Birds of Prey, parentheses, and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. You know what a harlequin is? A harlequin's role is to serve. It's nothing without a master. No one gives two shits who we are beyond that. The Joker and I broke up. I wanted a fresh start. But it turns out I wasn't the only Damon Gotham looking for emancipation. Miss Quinn, she belongs to me. Who are you guys? Here's the deal, Quinn. You need me. Birds of Prey, more simply is the newest film in the DC Extended Universe, which has recently brought us films like Shazam, Aquaman, Wonder Woman. Those are like the the new trinity, right? Of like, oh, these are the good ones. And uh, we you say that, but I genuinely forget about Shazam until people bring it up. Well, I'm a big fan of Shazam, and Shazam has a huge following, and it made a lot of money. Sure. So I'd say it's, it it's more than deserving of being at the top tier of their releases. Now, Joker which is currently in the Oscars race right now. It's one of the most successful DC films of all times, made over a billion dollars. That wasn't in that was not in the DC extended universe and you can tell because the Joker played by Joaquin Phoenix is not the Joker in this world, which maybe to some people is a little confusing because Birds of Prey is a spin-off slash follow-up to Suicide Squad which came out in 2016 slash reboot uh, you could, I guess, call it a reboot, although I th- I feel like we're being a little bit too, I don't know, liberal with the term reboot. Like, if you're not really changing the characters, you're not changing anything except for, like, we're just doing another one and it's a different tone and style. Well, I don't know. Sort of. I mean, I mean, it's kind of like the same logic as Deadpool, except that 
if that if Deadpool actually was still in the timeline of X Men Origins Wolverine. I see. I I don't even know if I would call that a reboot. I feel like that was a launch pad for its its own thing, and it just was not right. even related to. That's why I see this as mostly. But it is related because it has the same characters. It clearly has well, events that character. are established in this movie from Suicide Squad, right? Sure. Like the Jared Leto Joker is the Jared Leto Joker in this. Like they don't really shy sure. away from that, but they just don't show him. And they have like a picture of Boomerang at one point. But that's about it. Oh, I missed that. But there you go. Okay. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. yeah. I didn't even notice that. There, there are a lot of Easter eggs in this. And uh, I think that's one of its pleasures. But okay. So this movie stars Margot Robbie. She is doing her role as Harley Quinn once again. But we have a lot of new characters. We have Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Journey Smollett-Bell, Rosie Perez, Chris Messina. Ali Wong showed up in this movie, which was fantastic Mm -hmm. to see. Ella J. Basco. And Ewan McGregor as the big bat. And the story is that Harley Quinn, she's recently broken up with the Joker. It's kind of like a meta narrative of like the DC extended universe has sort of broken up with Joker. It's pretty on Mm -hmm. the nose about that. And she decides she wants to emancipate herself. The the problem that she faces is that the entire city wants her dead. And now that she's not dating the Joker, they feel like she is vulnerable and she has to answer now for all of these grievances people have against her, which we playfully learn over the course of the movie. Oh, this is why this person uh, hates Harley Quinn. And along the way, she joins up and makes some friends and frenemies with various vagabonds around Gotham who include Huntress, also known as the Crossbow Killer, who's not in a lot of this film, uh, mainly Black Canary, who is a singer for the big villain in this movie, and Rosie Perez as the detective, Renee Montoya, who is sort of, she sees this conspiracy from afar, and she's not only trying to hunt down Harley Quinn, but then also finds herself also trying to hunt down Black Mask, played by Ewan McGregor. It, it's a very complicated, convoluted crime plot but Harley Quinn herself sort of brings it all together because she is the narrator. This movie's doing kind of a combination of Goodfellas and Deadpool, where our character is breaking the fourth wall. She is guiding us along the movie, and it plays with structure a lot. We go back and forth in time. Something will happen, and she'll be like, oh, I, I didn't explain who this was. And then it goes back, and then it kind of takes you along in that way classic unreliable narrator absolutely she is the most unreliable narrator i've seen in a while and yeah so there's a lot going on here to parse it all out though i i think we're we're gonna have to hear it from harley quinn herself so here is a a quick clip from birds of prey i want to kill you because without the joker around i can all your noise and bluster you're just a a silly little girl with no one around to protect her whoa wait what don't kill me all right no no no, seriously Romy Romy come on there's gonna be something something we can figure out hey where were you lost something right you lost something I heard you say a diamond I can help you find it. Seriously. I know the East End better than anybody. You want this diamond back? I'm your gal. All right, that is from Birds of Prey, which is now playing in theaters, not making a lot of money so far, comparable to other DC films. But let's talk about what we thought of Birds of Prey, the film. Will Ashton, starting with you, what what do you think? Did Harley, Pin- did Harley Quinn get her her... Her, her, what's the word? Did she get her due? Did she get the movie Margot Robbie should have gotten with this character, maybe in Suicide Squad? Um, Yeah, I think to a certain extent. I did enjoy this quite a bit, though I don't know if I loved it as much as some people did, and that's fine. Like, I don't need to have the same opinion that everyone else has, but I did enjoy a good bit, mainly as a great showcase for Margot Robbie, like you said. Um, I think it's very apparent, especially nowadays, where it feels like the concept of a movie star is becoming 
less and less of a factor or less, less, less something that people take into consideration. Um, watch this movie, especially. I mean, it's been apparent with a, a couple of films recently, but I think this one really puts into great showcase how she is a movie star and she really, really embodies this role in a way that is not only clear that she's having a lot of fun with it, but in a way that like, I don't even think about Margot Robbie when she's playing Harley Quinn. Like I just think of Harley Quinn as a character. Absolutely. And I know that, and I know that this interpretation is like a little different than past interpretations from what I can tell, but I really think she makes it her own in a way that it's clear why they gave her a movie. And I think in other circumstances, I could see the it being a bit of a, um, I guess, I don't know what the word is, like kind of a maybe um, poor idea to make it her main character just because like she's like obviously like a villain character. And it's kind of hard to determine whether you're supposed to refer or not. I think the approach here was ultimately for the best. That said, I think the concept here is maybe better than the execution for the most part, uh, mainly in the sense that obviously it being a birds and prey movie, it's mostly centered around Harley Quinn to the point where we really don't get that much interaction with the other birds of prey ensemble. And I feel like that ultimately makes the end message not quite as resonant as I was hoping it would. And um, I also think the, the the structure of this, while ultimately entertaining, I, I think kind of has fits and starts as far as its success level. Like obviously some of the comedy I think can be kind of hit and miss in that regard. And also having it focus on long stretches on different characters while it's supposed to be like Harley Quinn's perspective kind of makes it a little uh, confusing. And like you said, a little convoluted at certain points, but as just a piece of entertainment, uh, even though it's a fairly messy film intentionally and not, because obviously I think the film is obviously trying to be a little messy in that, that way you're saying where it's like meant to be from an unreliable narrator's perspective. So it never was meant to be a clean narrative, but I, I also think that uh, there are some aspects of the film that are messy in ways that weren't intended, but just as a piece of entertainment, I think it's really enjoyable, but it's not one that I'm going to probably be thinking about much after I see it. I just enjoyed myself in the theater. That was fun. Mentally thought it was a great showcase for Margot Robbie, but otherwise I think it has uh, some things that didn't quite work for me, unfortunately. Well, well, so far, I just, I find myself agreeing with everything you're saying, which that's great. That is uh, that is the recipe for a very entertaining sure. podcast that is pleasing to the masses, right? But no, you yeah. literally have taken the words out of my mouth in so many ways uh, to the point where uh, I think your big, your big observation here, the fact that Harley Quinn is – this is her movie and the Birds of Prey themselves, we – we don't always get a lot out of them. Like it is a little imbalanced. I think we get a good amount of Black Canary, a good amount of Renee Montoya. We don't get a lot of Huntress. Like right. that's that's pretty rushed. And they, I don't know. There were there were some times when I was hoping these characters could interact a little bit more, where some more mm-hmm. sense could be made out of who they are in this city. My mm-hmm. chief criticism of this movie is something you kind of touched on, which is the fact that, like you said, Harley Quinn is a villain, and Half the time, this movie gets that perfectly. It knows that she's a villain. She's going to be bone-crunching violent. She's going to say naughty things, do mean things. And then other times, the movie sort of treats her like she's an anti-hero. And I just right. never thought it it quite captured that balance. It tried, and I think I think you're 100% right. The concept is better than the execution. And like, there's nothing in the premise or the setup of this movie, I would change except for maybe the title of the film. I understand that birds of prey is a cool title, but it does feel a little bit dishonest though. At the same time, I think the marketing for this was dead on. I think the trailers sure. told us exactly the kind of movie we were going to get uh, a flashy, entertaining crime action comedy. I was personally with this the whole way through, but like you said, some things just didn't quite work as well as I wanted them to big thing for me was the comedy. I didn't laugh once during this movie. Oh, really? It, for some reason, it, it, the comedy just did not hit me with this. And I think that's more about me. That's a John Agroni problem, as some kids on the streets <laughs> tend to uh, say. Yeah, we're, we're getting that catchphrase going. It's going to be on T-shirts <laughs> by 2021. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, yeah, something about the comedy, like, you know, I smiled and I didn't find it sure. boring or anything. But yeah, it just wasn't something that I found funny. Maybe if I did, I would have walked out of the theater feeling a little bit more satisfied. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of hit or miss things in, in this movie for me, although I do want to say one really positive thing about Harley Quinn in this movie is the writing for her. Like, obviously, Margot Robbie, we know she's great at, you know, actualizing this character, but the decision to really, really bring in her therapy background into like one of her superpowers mm-hmm. 
brilliant. I loved it. Every time she had a chance to display the fact that, yes, yeah, she has a PhD. She's very smart. She can size people up. She can figure out people, figure people out very quickly. Be, and that makes a lot of sense. It's something that we don't really get from a lot of adaptations of Harley Quinn, both in the comics and the TV show, the animated series where she originally showed up for the first time. She's always just sort of been the... I, don't, I hate to say this because it's a, a terrible term, but the dumb blonde, right, uh, kind of caricature that's sort of been definitely under the surface of her character for a long time. And what I really love about Margot Robbie and the writing behind this, Kathy Yen as director and everybody involved is that they're, in a way, they're emancipating Harley Quinn, the character, mm -hmm. out of this really gross box where she's just this... Sure sexual object to be ogled and in this abusive toxic relationship with the Joker that has troubling implications. And I'm getting into some more like psycho, you know, sort of sure. you know, psycho political things, but I think that's all really important. And in terms of this character's comic book origins and what they mean to this character now. Sure. And I think like comparing this to Suicide Squad, I mean, I know we talked before about the difference between male and female gays. And if I, people are still kind of confused about that, I would definitely say like watch Suicide Squad and watch this as far as like the differences between yeah. like the male gays and female gays. I mean, like, obviously not like a perfect comparison, but it's pretty stark in how like that movie looks at Harley Quinn as opposed to how this movie presents Harley Quinn. I, I think that's definitely a feather in this movie's cap. Yeah. Well, OK, here's the big question that we talked about the comedy. We talked about the characterization. But the action, the action is something I've been very curious what you might think about. Chad Sahelski, I think, came in for some reshoots with the action choreography, if I'm not mistaken. What, what did you think of this one? It's a hard R movie. Do you, do you think the action worked for you? Uh, for the most part, yeah. My only gripe with the action is I felt like some of it was a little too close as far as like the camera work. Like, I kind of wanted some of it to be pushed back a little bit. Like I was having trouble kind of like parsing some things out. Did you have that issue at all? I, I had that thought a few times, but I would say that I like the choreography enough to overlook That's it. That's what I mean. I like the choreography and I really like the production design in a lot of these scenes. Absolutely. As far as, yeah, I thought that was really cool, especially in the climax. Like, that's why I also wanted the camera to be pulled back a little bit because I felt like it was not maybe not claustrophobic in any sort of way, not like in a taken way, but like just something <laughs> about it just felt like it felt like it was like two notches too close. Like it felt like it needed to be a little bit back. I sound like the most professional way of describing it, but that's just something that stuck out to me while I was watching it. I would say that what stuck out to me is I thought the action and the choreography and all of that, it was more creative than I thought it was thrilling. I, I guess nothing mm -hmm. about the action. I never had that John Wick feel where I could feel True. the action happening, which is a high bar to hit. And I wasn't expecting that from this movie, so it wasn't a big problem for me. But I did find myself clinging more to the creativity and the production in this movie a lot more than the comedy. And that helped pull this one from being a bad time at the movies, I guess, if I had to put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I don't really feel as negatively as you do about the comedy as far as the... I mean, like I said, some of the jokes just don't work for me and that's fine. But I definitely got some solid laughs and chuckles out of this throughout. They're not as consistent as I wanted them to be, but I mean, I was fine with the comedy. But yeah, I mean, as far as the action is concerned... Uh, definitely knowing that Kathy Ann is, um, you know, this is like her first action oriented film. As far as I can tell, I haven't seen her first film, but um, yeah, I mean, it's I, a very I thought indie was, film. Right. That's what I figured. Uh, so this is definitely a big leap in that regard. But um, yeah, no, I, I was pretty satisfied with the action. I definitely really enjoyed the climactic scene. And I also really enjoyed the like, uh, I don't know what you call that, like the garage bunker police area scene. Like when. Oh, she's, right. Yeah. Uh, fighting I'd like to like, report a crime. Biker dudes. Well, I, no, I meant like the ones after that, like with the biker oh, with the dudes cages. And stuff. No, and that one was right. Yeah, I that, that was, was pretty cool. good. But um, that one you're talking about too was pretty fun, and I feel like that's pretty indicative of what I like about the film. Is that it has this kind of like shotgun mentality, where it's just kind of just going for it in every single way, and obviously that's not really going to work as far as being a consistent film. But I admire that films are willing to do this on this scale, and I'd, I'd see more films like this than something that's a little more sterile and calculated as far as its approach, yeah. which is what I ultimately appreciate about the DC films as opposed to Marvel films. Nothing against one or the other. It's just that I feel like DC, with their comic book properties, are more willing to take some chances with these type of films and kind of just try different things stylistically in a way that, at the very least, makes them interesting as far as their approach. I think that's the right word, stylistically. Like the Marvel films take chances in different ways, in ways that tend to be successful. But uh, I think I agree with you. The idea that th this movie takes such big swings and it's very director driven. It, it really bums me out that it's not getting the response from audiences that I think it deserves because it is a superhero movie that's doing different things. Now, 
at the same time, it didn't quite work for me, but I could see it working really well for other people. I think the thing that this movie has going for it the most is the ensemble. I think everybody is extremely well cast. I don't love some sure. of the directions and um, different things involving like screen time involve some characters as we've discussed, but I think everybody's cast really well. I, this version of Black Canary, I absolutely love it. I love the kind of new backstory they've put in with her. Although a little bit, a little bit of it did get into some like tropey things of like, okay, so we have a woman of color as Black Canary. That's really cool. But she has to have like the I grew up on the streets background, which is a little bit like really like that. I don't know. Something sure. about that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And there there are other things where like Huntress's backstory is just so like, I don't know if I love it or hate it. Uh, the, and it gets explained. I don't want to give away like who she is and how all that stuff happens. But it did feel like a combination of like two totally different things involving like the 20th century, like historical stuff that I was like. I don't know. I don't know how faithful it is to the comics. I'm not as familiar with Huntress, but yeah, when it comes to Renee Montoya and Rosie Perez, my goodness, like this is one of my favorite roles I've seen from her in so long. And that even, even her dead don't die cameo. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was going to say, it's been a while since she's had a role of this prominence. I feel yeah. in a major production. We we've been missing out uh, clearly. Cause she's still got uh, so much talent and I was really happy with how you McGregor turned out in this and I really like that. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it because it's different. He's playing like a mobster. He doesn't have any special superpowers, but he has personality. Like he actually, he's a little unpredictable. He was actually more of like a Joker kind of character than I was expecting. Like kind of unhinged and yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I thought the performance was really entertaining and I definitely felt like in certain moments it was uh, definitely very memorable and, and striking in that regard, but my only gripe was that it felt very apparent that this was meant to be a Sam Rockwell character and uh, having Ewan McGregor involved kind of felt like he was playing a Sam Rockwell character. like Which I think absence. is good. I think it was, I think he did fine. a great I mean, character. It just felt, I don't know, just like having an actor play a, a character that's meant for another actor while making it so apparent. There, that's the first thing we disagree on then, because I think he made it his sure. own. I didn't find it beholden to, to Sam Rockwell at all. I don't know. I mean, I just felt like as soon as he came on, I was just like, oh, this is like meant to be Sam Rockwell's part. <laughs> I mean, I don't know for sure if like they approached Sam Rockwell, but it just felt very Sam Rockwell like in like an er like before, like he started playing racist uh, predominantly. <laughs> so I'm guessing that's what happened here was like this character isn't racist. <laughs> and then they well, I guess not directly, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you could compare him a little bit to uh, Sam Rockwell's character and Jojo Rabbit because like he's like super evil and then he's <laughs> anyway we're, we're getting off topic I just really like the twist that they put on Black Mask here I love his very uh his relationship sort of with Zaz in here played by Chris Messina like what a dynamic I just I don't know I couldn't get enough of these two these two characters and this is a movie with so much like I don't the so many characters where it was just tossed in there in in a way that felt right to me like characters could be bisexual they could be gay mm -hmm. they could be all kinds of different things and like the movie doesn't slow down to a halt to make the biggest deal out of it it just allows it to be and that, that was something that i found really refreshing you know i was a little worried mm -hmm. like kind of during the movie is like oh no like is this going to be one of those things where the gay villain is going to be like the version of a gay villain we see in like the really like the troublesome disney characters where it's sort of treated like flamboyancy equals evil but th yeah. they get around that really well here and so I, that was something i really appreciated yeah i mean it's like it's weird mix of like a movie that's clearly hearkening back to like the 80s 90s mentality as far as comic book movies but its values are fairly progressive at the same time. So it's kind of like this nice forward and backwards at the same time in that regard. Like a good, like a good, good retro. I mean, in that, in that sense. Yeah. Speaking of which, actually, a lot of people have been comparing this to the Joel Schumacher Batman movies, right? It's like, right. Oh, it's kind of yeah. got a similar sort of vibe. It's closer to Batman and Robin. Some people have said more like the Adam West TV show. Uh, did you have an opinion more on Batman that? forever? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like what I'm referring to is that like, it, it allows itself to be, goofy and less self-serious which i mean obviously isn't something that has been totally absent from recent dc movies as made evident by uh, shazam but yeah it just shows that like they're allowing their movies to have a little bit more personality having a little bit more of a like a quirk like a 
colorful visual yeah. palette and a little bit more personality in that regard. And, you know, I mean, like I said, while this movie doesn't work in full for me, I, I admire that. And I think that's a fun way of going about it as long as, you know, don't like overdo it. Like I think like Batman Robin, I think for a lot of people kind of like oversaturated that to the point where people got yeah. turned off by it. But um, yeah, no, in this film, I thought it worked to its favor. Well, I really liked this Gotham. Like I liked being in this Gotham. Sure. I thought there was a lot of cool. There was a lot of uh, surprising twists to this version where I don't know characters felt like they lived here, they existed here, and the tone was right. Uh, and in that sense, it was one of the few things in this movie that surprised me. Uh, I felt like the movie didn't surprise me in a lot of other ways. Maybe that's getting more to the comedy thing. My last main criticism is I just I did not love this version of Cassandra Kane. I thought that there was a lot missing there in the relationship between Harley Quinn and the, I guess she's supposed to be Batgirl eventually, but uh, L.J. Basco's character. I don't know. There was just something about this character. Like, it, it, I feel like we're missing some scenes that really round out like who she is, why she's here, and and all of that, where I felt like she was sort of a, almost like a cipher for this movie and a MacGuffin instead of a really like multi-dimensional character of, with agency. Uh, it, it's it's not terrible or anything. Like it's not something that I think drags the movie down to like uh, a really bad place. But it was it was a big missed opportunity that I saw in it. You're, you're talking about the kid, right? The kid, the kid. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I, she even looks like I, I the kids know. in distress from like adventure movies. But I mean, I, I mostly agree with that in the sense that I felt like a lot of like the way that they presented her character felt very tropey. Right. And like a lot of ways that like, yeah, just like, you know, like she's like, you know, stealing and then kind of like indirectly gets involved. Yeah. It, it you know, it's it's it is what it is. But um, yeah, it did feel like it, it fell into one too many tropes. For a film that was really trying hard in almost every other respect to be fairly progressive and uh, fresh in its approach. Yeah, yeah, no pun intended, but I thought the ending was a little bit of a cop out. Uh, just a little bit, a little bit. I didn't, I didn't sure. love some of the final, like very, very final scenes, but it's fine. It, the movie's fine. Uh, I give it a B minus. I think it's a good time at the theater. I think you'll enjoy it if you enjoyed a lot of these more recent DC extended universe films. It's definitely stronger than Suicide Squad and uh, in a lot of ways, in a lot of important ways. So yeah, B minus for me. It's good. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think 100% is better than Suicide Squad. I wish I was as favorable on it as a lot of people are, and that's fine. Yeah, a lot of people um, really, really love enjoyed this. It. Right, yeah, and that's cool. I mean, I'm glad. And um you know, maybe repeat viewings will make me really appreciate this, but I enjoy it a lot, mainly as a great showcase for Margot Robbie. I mean, if they do continue this like spinoff franchise, I really hope the future installments focus more on the actual like ensemble of Birds of Prey working together, whereas this kind of felt like it was clipped on at the end and I didn't really get the full right. sense of their like camaraderie and chemistry yet. Um, but you know, as as a nice way of kind of doing a um sense of like i guess you know restoring the justice for this character kind of doing something that felt more worthy of this performance that we saw from margaret roby and suicide squad it definitely it, there's a lot to appreciate here and from yet for that i'm gonna give it a solid b minus as well yeah well that makes sense we we basically said all the same things about the movie so almost in total sure. agreement uh so b minus sounds about right yeah i i my one edit is like i just wish it had been called harley quinn and the birds of prey or like Harley Quinn presents birds of prey or something, right? Like where it's a little bit more well, forward we about, that. well, it's, it's Harley Quinn's movie. And I think it's just a bit of a misdirect to call it birds of prey. Now let's look at the box office real fast. Uh, this movie costs about $84.5 million to make probably a little bit more than that because of reshoots. Uh, it didn't have the best opening weekend. If you compare it to other DC films, it had an $81.3 million box office. It's going to do fine. It's probably going to do a little yeah, bit better than break even. even. Yeah. The only thing is like, uh, yeah, I just worry like, Oh, does that mean we're not going to get any more of these? And I feel like the next one of these could be really, really polished now that they've kind of figured out their wavelength. And I don't know. I, I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see if DC is going to take another chance. It's not, it wouldn't be the first time they would follow up a, a film that was just okay box office wise with something else. But I think it's going to depend on world box office in this case. It seems like if it has a big enough appeal outside of the United States and it gets, if that helps to like make it a sizable hit, then that'll probably justify a second film. Yeah, it's doing okay overseas. And I feel like it's going to be a okay. big discussion over the next couple of weeks 
over why. Why is this film, despite strong reviews from critics, why is it faltering a bit? You know, ahead of this movie's release, a lot of people were, a lot of like really annoying people were sort of saying this movie's going to be unsuccessful because it's uh, it's too woke and anti-men, which is ridiculous. Like it's it's an absolute false premise that this movie is anti-male or any of this stuff. Uh, it is just sort of like a I think whenever a film comes out that has women at the forefront, there's always this like knee jerk reaction to it of like, ah, uh, people hate men. And it's like, no, because for one masculinity is challenged. Exactly. It's like super sensitive to the fact that like not every movie has to be in total service to a male ensemble. Uh, but that's a, that's a rant for another day, I suppose. True. Let's move on to our next review. This is a film that actually premiered at the Sundance film festival, but I did not see it then. Uh, part of the reason I didn't is because it just got released on Netflix uh, just this past weekend, and that is Horse Girl, which was directed and produced by Jeff Baena, and it's actually from a screenplay by from Baena and Allison Brie. Uh, so you may know mm-hmm. him as he worked on The Little Hours, which she was also in with her husband, Dave Franco. Uh, he also co-wrote I Heart Huckabees with David O. Russell, uh, also did Life After Death. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so Jeff Banna, great to see him uh, back in the director's chair. Uh, this new movie stars Alison Brie along with Debbie Ryan. You may re- recall from Netflix's Insatiable. Uh, you can ca- sort of get the sense from these movies that these Netflix movies that they keep bringing in people that like have like Netflix. They, they're in like the Netflix media universe, right? Because Alison Brie, she's in BoJack Horseman, she's in Glow. She's kind of like a Netflix superstar, I suppose. But uh, also John Reynolds, Molly Shannon, John Ortiz, which who I didn't know he was going to be in this, and Paul Reiser, which I was like, oh, hey, Paul. Um, Will, do you want to try to describe this movie? Because I'm at a loss. Uh, sure. I mean, I also want to point out he did Joshi, which is probably my favorite of his films so Oh, far. yeah. Sorry. I forgot to... Pre- I, don't, yeah. I don't know if you saw that one or not. No, no. Uh, and I forgot to mention, too, the Duplass Brothers uh, Productions is behind this as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can tell, I think, because not that turns its production value, just it has that kind of mumblecore aesthetic, I think. A little bit. It's typically bit. associated with their, with their brand. Um, well, as far as the plot is concerned, we follow a girl named Sarah, played by Alison Brie, and she's fairly shy. She works at a craft store. Uh, her only real personality traits outside of that are that she does Zumba and she watches uh, a show called, well, there's another thing I'll get to in a bit, but she watches a show called Purgatory, which is like kind of like a more like over the top version of like a CSI kind of spinoff. Um, like maybe what's that Lucifer show that I think something like kind of like in that vein, I'd have to assume. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty good summation of like that combination of, cause they even have like actors in this movie from like yeah. that CSI show. So, right. And I thought those scenes were great. Um, I really enjoyed those. Um, but so She's turning like 30 something, I think. I don't know if they ever actually specify what age she turns, but she recently had a pretty big birthday and uh, she knows that her family history has kind of a checkered past. She doesn't know the full details of it, but um, there's definitely some dark mental illness involved with her family history. And over the course of the next couple of weeks after her birthday, she notices some kind of disturbing patterns going along. Like time's not really making sense. She's falling asleep and then like she finds herself in a different place. Other factors are coming in and she starts to kind of unravel her mind. But in her sense, like she thinks maybe I'm not unraveling. Maybe I'm just finally seeing the world as it is. And as far as its presentation is concerned, in some way or another, it seems to be kind of commenting on the traditional Sundance movie where like we follow a character that's kind of quirky in this presentable sort of way. And then they kind of really break it down in a, in a way that uh, is a little more genre based. I don't want to specify too much because I, I think it's better if you go into this, not really knowing a lot about what genre turns it takes, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it definitely feels like a film that's kind of commenting on the festival that it was at in some ways. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but uh, it definitely seems to be, it makes sense that Alison Brie was involved in a creative sense in addition to her performance because it seems to be kind of commenting on the performances that or the characters that she's typically associated to play in different ways or another. And um, I thought as a showcase for her, it was really, really solid. Um, I think this is easily one of her best performances. She's also said that uh, when she co-wrote the screenplay, uh, this character is based partly on her own experiences with mental health, uh, not just for her, but also in her family. Right. Yeah, and I think you can tell. I mean, definitely, it feels very passionate from her perspective. And I, like I said, I think it's one of her best performances. 
Um, but I'm very curious where you land on it. I, I won't divide, divulge too much more as far as the plot's concerned. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Well, it wasn't the the gritty reboot of Unicorn Store I was expecting. That's for sure. What's well, a thing? I mean, I, <laughs> I I I was thinking about Unicorn Store a lot while I was watching this. And I'm like, this is what I wanted from Unicorn Store <laughs> in some respects. <laughs> well, yeah, there. I wouldn't say one's better than the other, but I would say that they're both two sides of the same coin. Uh, not just yeah, there are some superficial comparisons of like, all right, uh, a girl who's clearly like involved in some sort of surreal, absurdist plot involving a horse you know but this movie i think is a little bit more introspective it's a little bit more it takes itself Mm -hmm. quite a bit more seriously compared to that film and uh, also a netflix film um Mm -hmm. this one though it does take some directions i'll say this the nicest thing i'll say about horse girl a film that overall i enjoyed and i somewhat recommend to people who if you watch the trailer and you're on its wavelength in the trailer Check it out. It's it's nothing worth your time. But if if you tend to shy away from weirder, more absurdist films, this might be a tough one for you to stay with. But I was with this movie. I I watched it and it had my full attention the entire the entire runtime. I never stopped wanting to see mm-hmm. what was going to happen in the next scene. I constantly was. I felt like there was. It was always refreshing. It's filmmaking, which I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Like you kind of mentioned the sci-fi turns this movie doesn't have just like one beat it's like a total symphony of nonsense (laughs) to some extent Mm -hmm. uh, but also some really cool ideas and i i don't know every once in a while something in this movie would would happen where i just felt like i was in a different movie but not really and so i was very fascinated by the creativity on display. I can tell that Bayana was really experimenting with how you can change up a film's style and energy throughout while still telling the same story. Again, try not to give too much yeah. away. Where I was constantly second guessing what was going on in the movie. I was constantly wondering, you know, coming up with theories for what was going on. Whenever a film can engage me on that sort of level where I'm I'm in its world and I'm trying to figure it out and I'm doing it wholeheartedly, not in a way that's making me resentful uh that's when i know I, i've watched something that is definitely special and i don't know if it's going to hold up on repeated viewings but yeah I, I definitely i know the type of people who should check out this movie immediately and i also know the type of people who probably don't want to give it more than 10 minutes before they give up yeah i mean i definitely think one of the things that impressed me the most was the visual style of it as far as um like what, how you pronounce his last name? Biana? Bana? I think it's uh, Bayana, but it's, that's probably Bianna? wrong. Okay. It could be um, Bayana, Bayana. Like, yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I like these other films a good bit, but it feels like this one is him really pushing his creative style a bit, especially in some key ways I found pretty intriguing as far as getting into the mental headspace of the character, like having like the backgrounds change. Like when it like goes from like over the shoulder to like back and forth and like, you know, just kind of puts you in a sense of unease, but not like in a over the top sort of way. And I found that pretty admirable. And it shows that I'm I'm very curious to see if he's going to take that direction for his future films or if he's going to kind of go back to going to like kind of the more casual vibe that you got from his past few films. Yeah. But it does show that he has more range than I think some people were anticipating from his first three or four films. And uh, I'm excited to see that for sure. Yeah, I was I was surprised every plaza wasn't in the movie because uh, they right. tend to yeah, work together. Yeah. They've it, been yeah. dating for a long, long time and they tend to like, work together about a lot. 10 years now. Oh yeah. It has, it has, probably has been almost a decade, huh? I think 2012. Yeah. I think something so, like years. that. Yeah. Gossip. <laughs> Regardless. I, yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely respect this guy and like his commitment to when he's working on a movie, he always goes all the way with it. Right. I don't think mm-hmm. this is as strong as Little Hours. I think Little Hours just hit me a little bit more emotionally. Uh, and that ensemble is just in- incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed Little Hours. I think you certainly were more taken by oh, yeah. it than I was. But I think the way you felt about Little Hours, I think, was somewhat more in vain as how I felt to Joshi, where like that film's not like revolutionary in a particular way. But just when I saw it, it was just when it hit me, it was just like, oh, okay, like this is definitely my kind of thing. And uh, that made me very excited to see where he's going to go as a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, I, I do want to see that. I think that that's the one with uh, Thomas Middleditch, right, from Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are in it, but yeah, he, he's the main star. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I missed that. that was... And Alison Brie is in that for a brief bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and is Aubrey Plaza in it? That'll seal mm-hmm. the deal. She is. Sure. 
All right, it's on. I'm watching Joshi. Forget the Oscars. <laughs> After we're done recording this episode, I'm going to be watching. <laughs> but, all right. Uh, I don't have too much to but, say uh, about Horse Girl because I, I don't want to say anything else. I don't want to give anything away. But yeah, was there anything else that's on your mind with this one? Uh, how are you feeling? Um, yeah, I mean, just some of the more the things I'm a little more critical of, which is that, I mean, I really liked the execution of it. I really appreciated uh, Al- Allison Bree's performance. I almost said Aubrey. Uh, uh, Aubrey Blaza again, but um, <laughs> I think slip, my I only guess. thing was that, like, yeah, but um, I think ultimately some things in the third act just don't quite work for me. As far as I mean, I still appreciate, like you said, I was pretty gripped with it throughout, but as far as like what it's ultimately trying to say about mental health, I think it gets a little uh muddled by the end, yeah, and I, yeah, make some choices that it kind of took me out of it. Like, I think it will treat some people, but for me, it was taken away from what I found really interesting and fascinating about the film. It's a shame. Cause I think the first two thirds of this are really solid. And, uh, like I said, I think it shows a lot of, uh, great promise for the future of, uh, Jeff Bonner's career. And also, you know, Alison Brie, as far as not only being an actress, but a writer, I'd be curious to see her take on more roles like this uh, yeah. from both in both capacities. But, um, yeah, as, as far as the movie's concerned, I'd give it a high B minus, I think just for, like I said, like those couple things really ultimately took me out of it a little bit, but, um, like I said, I definitely enjoyed it and I think it has an audience that will appreciate it. Yeah. I'm a low B. I'm going to give it a little bit of an edge. Yeah. I, I agree with those criticisms okay. to an extent. I think that the ending makes it feel long in a way that the first two thirds didn't. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. where it, it did kind of lose me. And so many things happen in the third act that are so esoteric. I wasn't sure where I was supposed to be at that point in the movie. And agreed, it's clumsy with its mental health uh, messaging. And I think some things in the second half, or sorry, the second act, I felt a little rushed as far as its presentation. Like it just felt like it kind of like hit. Uh, maybe that's, you know, maybe that plays its advantage for some people, but I felt like it kind of like rushed to the third act in some respects. But. Yeah, I mean, I get why it did. The, Not, I, I, I get why it's that. the way it is. No, I, I would agree with that. I think I think the second act is okay. pretty graceful, just for me personally. But yeah, I, okay. I would say it, it, I didn't. Maybe uh, maybe we draw the line differently in certain parts. But I, I think that is the case in the third act. I think there are some rush moments there. But I, it never occurred sure. to me that oh, that's a bit of a leap. You know, uh, no horse pun intended. Uh, that that is sure. one thing though. The the horse thing. There are some things I'm still thinking about okay. that. And again, this is one of those movies where it's kind of, you know, it is a little silly for us to be putting grades on it when I, I feel like I'd have to see this movie a couple of times to totally have a full opinion on it. Uh, I don't know how you feel, okay. but yeah, I, I, I'm a B right now. I could easily see myself being lower or higher uh, the second or third time watching this. The only problem is I don't think I will rewatch it anytime soon. So yeah, that's the thing know. is that I don't really feel like I'm going to be rewatching at any point. So I don't know how my grade's going to change in that regard, yeah. but I don't know. I mean, depending on how well it sticks with me, I think that's ultimately where I'm going to land on it. But yeah, I enjoyed it for a while. I was watching it despite my criticisms. All right. Well, that's a high B minus for you. Low B for me. So still pretty good grades all around. All right. So it's, it's been a B kind of show lately. A lot of bees. Uh, it's like the it's the bee podcast, kind of like the bee movie. So, but... so speaking of bees <laughs> and horse related projects. Ah, oh, you got involving... it right out of me. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Let's... Involving Allison Brie. Let... <laughs> Allison B, you mean? Let's talk yeah. about BoJack Horseman season six. Now, uh, the newest season of BoJack Horseman, and it technically started earlier in the year. It, the first six episodes, I want to say, were dropped on Netflix. The final, yeah, yeah, the final episodes have just come out. I forget, how many episodes was it? Six more? Or um, more so than that? I think it was sixteen episodes overall. So it was eight episodes for the first half. Okay, and then eight episodes for the second half, if I'm not mistaken. Now you've seen the entire second half of the season. Now I just mm-hmm. got through. I think I'm on episode twelve right now. So I'm, yep. I'm a good ways in. I just started season six. Like when the episodes dropped earlier in the year, I didn't watch them because. I didn't want to. I was like, I, I'm going to have to watch the entire thing when it's all out there. And I'm really glad I did that because I can't imagine what everybody else was going through at the end of episode six. 
It's like, I don't know, it just drops you right there. And uh, I was so happy that I waited because then going through the whole six season chronologically like this has been pretty rewarding for me personally, but I haven't finished it. Well, you have. So obviously we're not going to give a lot of things away. If you've never watched Bojack Horseman and, and you don't know the show, please go to the timestamps. You can go to our final review for Timmy Failure, which is right after this. Uh, you definitely don't want to hear any of this if you're not into the show, because maybe you will be eventually and you don't want to be spoiled on some of the plot stuff sure. that's going on. Now, if you haven't seen, if you are all the way caught up with season five, we won't be giving away like the season, fa- like the series finale or anything like that. We're going to be talking about the season as a whole, but general impressions will. What did you think of season six and Bojack Horseman, the show? Uh, so you're talking about like the whole thing, right? Like the first half and the second half, or you just want to hear about my, the second half opinions. I want to hear everything. Okay. Um, so I, I, I was, they did something kind of similar to you where I, mostly kept off the episodes until the second half premiered so i like basically binged them leading up to the uh second half but um my impression of the first half was like it was fine like you know it's still it's bojack i really enjoyed it but it it didn't feel like quite the same as the past couple seasons where like it was still funny and you know i I, so yeah no I, i i enjoyed the first half but it didn't hit me quite as hard um as i was anticipating but the second half like especially with the um i don't know what would you call that like the season 6b premiere or part two premiere sure um i felt like that that was like okay this is like what i've been looking for like this is what i wanted out of season six uh aka the final season and uh from there i've really really enjoyed all these uh eight uh remaining episodes and um like i said i don't want to give away anything in particular as far as the plotting but it definitely involves repercussions and looking at bojack like now that he is actually taking some proactive measures as uh an addict and someone who uh has you know done a lot of wrongs it's like even though he is looking to be a better person and taking proactive steps to better himself like does that resolve the problems that have happened in the past and like does that you know cancel out his sins and obviously the show in the second half takes a free firm stance on that but um just the way it leads up to especially from a writing standpoint um i really really appreciate this and i think some aspects of it feel a little rushed as far as like you could tell that Um, I think they wanted to have like maybe another season or two and some things kind of come out a little hasty as far as uh, I'm concerned, but just as as far as the execution is concerned, I really, really enjoyed these final episodes and it feels pretty surreal to know that, uh, cause I just finished them earlier today that there's no more Bojack and that's it. Like the show is done as far as I can tell. Then that's pretty sad. Yeah. Well, I think for what we got. I'm I'm really happy that this this show exists as we've talked about mm-hmm. and oh for sure that yeah. we got six seasons out of it because it is the kind of show that I'm surprised it got more than one honestly I was gonna say I mean I think if this was like on Comedy Central or something like that it wouldn't have lasted no. more than a season maybe even half a season would have gotten canceled so I am grateful for Netflix in that regard I think that this show it's it's not just the comedy it's not just that it's funny it it's so mm-hmm. layered in its writing and everything oh, sure. is just so it's a treasure trove of just brilliant humor and drama uh you get so mm-hmm. much of both and so far again i haven't finished it but i'm right there with you i think season six has been really strong i i, I don't think any of these seasons have been weak I, I don't think we've gotten a lot of weak episodes in general and i just sort of follow it as an ongoing story to the point where i have a mm-hmm. hard time comparing the seasons like looking back sure. like there's nothing that i really mm-hmm. hold over the other there are moments that stick out more than others there but they're all from like different parts of the show and even though it is a show that has sort of they didn't know how many seasons they were going to get they didn't know when they were going to be finishing things you do kind of get the sense of like this is the story they wanted to tell all along i guess and that's that's mm-hmm. impressive to me And yeah, Bojack goes through quite a transformation in this season. And there was something I realized while I was watching this was like, man, this guy, his, his actions and the way he reacts to things like little things, like when he has to deal with, like, he's trying to be a better person, like you said, but he still has to deal with consequences. People still perceive him a certain way. And he doesn't, he doesn't react the way that he should act. He reacts like a human being, but he's a horse Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that's like that sums up this show so well is it's it's humor is all tied up in that decision that these characters are humans and animals and the playfulness between that idea and and how you can make these characters feel so real 
and human by taking them to such absurdist extremes. Like it's just such a brilliant thing. And it, it's so funny to me too, because this, this whole show, it's so specific to celebrity problems and things that most mm-hmm. people watching it don't relate with, you know, like these are things that people are relating to right now. People who've been, you know, quote, canceled, whatever that really means, mm-hmm. you know, like people who've been under huge scrutiny by people who are online and who've yeah. faced like a lot of backlash for their toxic behavior. And True. what I think is interesting about this show is that it takes you inside the head of somebody who's going through that and it doesn't try to make you sympathize with this person in a way where where it's like we can all relate with that it's not even trying to be universal it's just sort of carefully laying out what this is like how it makes somebody feel and what you might think about it it's very like the audience can participate with this show without feeling like the audience has to be a surrogate and i think that's pretty meaningful and i think that that's that's a hard thing to do because it's hard for people to watch a show that where they're not they don't feel like they're the central character. I was like, man, I've been through that. You know, like the show doesn't even try to do that. And I respect it for that. Yeah. I mean, just knowing that a show like an animated Netflix sitcom involving an aging alcoholic horse am- anthropomorphic horse man is one of the most like honest and moving and realistic depictions of mental health and addiction and uh, recent memory and any medium is just like a fascinating thing. And, like you said, just it's a credit to the writing. It's a credit to also the performances. I think something that gets overlooked a lot is how good the voice acting is throughout the show. Yeah, uh, especially I mean, considering like you know these are mostly pretty big names, and like you know when I watch it, like I don't think like oh that's Will Arnett or oh that's Allison Brie or oh that's Aaron Paul. Uh, like I just see the characters, and I think they embody them very well. Especially as the show goes on, you they have a better understanding of their personalities. Um, yeah, there's so much to appreciate with the show, especially like you said, like the setting of it. Uh, just like the creative little touches they have in the environment. And obviously, I think anyone who watches the show should they'll be doing their, the disservice. So they don't constantly pause it to look at all the different background gags and little sight gags that are found throughout the show. Uh, it's just so much to appreciate on so many levels. Like you said, it's such a layered, uh, well-crafted thing. And I'm very appreciative of it. And I'm sorry to see it go. Yeah, you you really touched on the mental health issues in this show and all of that in a lot of episodes slow down and they focus on one character one episode in particular that hit me like a ton of bricks was diane's episode where she's dealing with uh, a version of writer's block and depression Uh that completely sent me on a journey emotionally because this entire show i've just found myself again and again being like why do i relate with diane more than anybody else here and i think that that's because I I've been through a lot what this character has been through very unusual circumstances, but like just that there's an episode about writing the book that you don't want to be writing, but you know, you're supposed to, and people telling you it's bad for your mental health, that you're trying to write what everybody wants you to write instead of what you want to write. That's not something that a lot of people deal with. I don't think like, at least in that specific, like writing a book sort of sense where you have written books before And you're sort of like, you know, I start this show all the time with like, I wrote books, blah, blah, blah. And it's something that's always in my head of like, I'm supposed to be writing a certain book right now and it's not working or I'm not in a place where I feel like I can do it. And when you deal with anxiety and depression all mixed in that, it's you feel alone. You feel like nobody else understands. So I don't know. I just have to chalk this show up to like, it, it just finds a way to bring people in. Uh, with this this sort of like this level of relatability that in one episode is like right there. And then every other episode, I'm like, yeah, you know, like Bojack's not a guy that I personally like. I've never dealt with addiction. I've never dealt with, you know, th- his his issues as they relate to how he uses acting right as like a crutch for his relationships. But I do find these other characters, specifically Diane, who I can't stop relating with. And I wonder if that's maybe a recipe for the show's success. Like you said, is its ensemble, it's the voice actors, it's how everybody can find themselves really just touched with a certain piece of the show. And so, yeah, I'm sad to see the show go, but man, it's, it, they really nailed it and they did a great job. And I think it's hopefully ending on a great note. Again, I, I'm still a few episodes away. I'm going to finish it this week. And uh, maybe Will, you and I off the air, will have a, a more complete conversation, spoilers and all, 
uh, about this one because I think it deserves it. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited for you to check out the last few episodes. I mean, like I said, I won't spoil anything, but I will say that I think it ends in a way you expect, but also not exactly how you expect. And I think it, it, it's very fitting of the show. And I, I'm very pleased with how the final few episodes wrapped up. Yeah. Before we move on, though, I have to say one of my favorite new side character gags, probably my favorite since Vincent Adult Man, has to be yeah. Paige and Maximilian, the Hollywood Reporters. Oh, yeah. I I swear, will every single time these two characters started talking and and interacting, I just it's too funny. <laughs> it's just too <laughs> funny. <laughs> I found, I, like myself, that, uh, they, I found myself. I found myself like pausing and just either laughing or just like say, talking that way just for fun. And oh, I love this show. Yeah, and they they're very smart about like using them in a practical sense, as far as like not overdoing it and uh, definitely helping it to serve the story as well. But um, I really appreciate what they do with those two characters in the episode that Johnny Sun wrote. His only episode he wrote. Um, I don't know if you got that far yet, but that's mm. one of my favorites this season. They play pretty heavily in that one. So. Yeah, I'm not sure which episode no. you're talking about. So yeah, well, off the air, we'll have to it's the, confirm that. Yeah. Wait, which one did you see? What's the last one you saw? Uh, I'd have to look it up because I I'm I don't remember. I think no, I mean, it's like episode 12. I, I, I don't remember. Okay. Hold on. Let me think. I think I think it's episode 13 that I'm thinking of. So it's probably the one you got to watch next. It's it's possible. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't want to say anything specific because then that might, you know, damper somebody's expectations. I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking up now, but I'll let you know. Yes or no. If it's the one you've seen or if it's the one coming up. Oh, but, I'm on episode yeah, 14. Really. Holy shoot. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty I'm farther along than I thought. I, I have been sort of powering through it. Um, I'm actually uh, no, I'm at, I'm on episode 15. My gosh. So OK, so you're pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I just I'm like halfway through episode 15 as I'm looking at it, yeah. and then it's well, the one over. I was thinking of was the the lazy Susan one was one I was thinking of. Ah, uh, okay. Really? So yeah. okay, that kind of makes sense. I like that one a lot. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, that's BoJack Horseman season six. Heartful recommendations from Will and myself for the whole show. If you've if for some reason you're still listening and you've never seen BoJack Horseman, you did not listen to my warnings. First of all, I love you. You're a rebel. I want you to keep working. But uh, yeah, if you're still with us, please, please, please. You can now go through the entire series. I highly recommend it. All right, let's finish this episode out with our final review. Let's talk about Timmy Failure, Mistakes Were Made. This is a new comedy slash fantasy film, which just premiered on Disney+. Plus. Uh, it did also come out in Sundance, uh, uh, another Sundance film. And another quick release yep. right after. It's based on a book series of the same name by Stefan Pastis. And yeah, you can watch it right now on Disney+. Plus. And I was surprised to see because I had heard about this. But then I was like, oh, Tom McCarthy <laughs> directed this, which is uh, yeah. uh, kind of an interesting kind of an interesting appearance. So yeah, uh, Will, mm-hmm. what is this one about? I have not seen Timmy Failure Mistakes Were Made, but uh, who's in this? What's it about? Tell us all about it. Sure, yeah. Um. I'm not too familiar with the book series, but I'm assuming it's not super popular. I mean, popular enough to make a movie, but um, not enough where it's like as famous as something like Die for Wimpy Kid or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of details with this film are pretty fascinating. Like this being the uh, Tom McCarthy's follow up to Spotlight, uh, this being a Disney production, just a lot of it. And uh, it, it gets a little more weirder as it, you, you talk about it more, because basically such a plot involves a young uh I'll use the overword, overused word, precocious kid uh, named Timmy Failure, which was something that instantly endeared me to the film because I thought Timmy Failure was going to be like a nickname, like a playground nickname that they gave him. Like he would have been like Timmy Filbert or something and just like Timmy Failure. But no, his name is actually Timmy Failure for a reason. They Amazing. In a fairly amusing way. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is 11 year old kid, you know, obviously a social outcast, but he lives in Portland, Oregon with his single mom and he runs a company called Toto Failure Inc., which is a private detective company with his partner, who is a polar bear. Uh, and they just kind of go around trying to mm. solve different child related mysteries or personal mysteries as far as his life. That sounds a lot um, like this new book I've been reading called Ivy Tran Food Court Detective. And uh, I wonder <laughs> if it's in the same universe. Oh, man. If only. Yeah, I was thinking about Ivy Tran as we were watching <laughs> it. That's a reference to BoJack yeah. if you skip the head. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Timmy ventures basically we just follow his mindset or his uh perspective i mean uh just following the different various things like his mom getting a new boyfriend uh his 
social uh, unbecomings, I guess, in school and just his inability to uh, be ready for middle school, which is going to happen next year and different other various things in his life. And yeah, I mean, I really, really like Tom McCarthy stuff. Like I've really enjoyed like going back to Station Agent. Um, I think the first one I watched was a visit. But ever since then, like I've really enjoyed his stuff. I've really championed him. And obviously he had one setback with um, The Cobbler. But I think all of his other movies are really solid. And I mean, yeah, really this is the guy who made Meet the Parents. I mean, <laughs> well, he was in Meet the Parents. I think he's like the therapist or like the a-hole boyfriend or something in Meet the Parents. He's, he was an actor before he became a filmmaker. But um, you're right, because yeah, he, like I, he, he was directed by Jay Roach. He, he didn't direct Meet the Parents. Right. What am I thinking? Yeah, his first movie was The Station Agent in 2003. But yeah, he was like a character actor before he became uh, a filmmaker. But yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, like just kind of like you said, very random out of the blue. Like he's involved to this young a property that just happened to just drop on Netflix fairly unannounced. And uh, I really didn't have many expectations going into this. And I just was like, I really like Tom McCarthy's stuff. I'll check out this film. You know, it's on Disney Plus, fairly accessible. And I got to tell you, John. I really liked this movie in a way that I was not anticipating going into. What? Like I was like, you know, it's going to be cute. I I've heard this is surprisingly good. Like this is surprisingly well done. Like because people have people have said like, "Oh yeah, you can tell this is the guy who co-wrote Up." Right? You can tell this is mm-hmm. the guy who, you know, has worked on uh, like you said, like Spotlight, even though this is for kids. What's the thing is like it's like watching a Dire Wimpy Kid movie if like Rushmore era Wes Anderson made it. Like, it's just like a fascinating, like, if you give a, I mean, I can't speak for the um, books and I know the author co-wrote this. So obviously he has some influence on how good or um, how good or bad this movie is. But like, just seeing that, like you said, like, you can tell that this is a director that is kind of above the like director for hire mode that like usually gets attached to these properties. Um, You know, it was really refreshing. You can, like you said, you can definitely tell that Carm- Tom McCarthy's influence is apparent throughout this. Um, You know, it's a little bit, uh, um, higher energy than his usual films are and you know obviously it's a lot more kid friendly but it's unmistakably his work and i think his influence especially his dry sense of humor and his like kind of satirotic wit wit uh is very apparent throughout this thing to the point where i was really engaged with it throughout and i think it's also credit to the performances i don't know the main kid's name i'm gonna look it up right now i think it's winslow something yeah winslow Philly. i don't know if this is his first film or not i don't, I don't remember seeing him in anything else but he just captures the right uh tone and I like his like emotional maturity or lack thereof throughout the film I found really impressive and you know it's always a risk when you give a young kid you know especially one that's like just barely in the double digits their own film to lead but um I really enjoyed it and I think the style the present the presentation of the film especially the way it presents is uh, setting Portland, Oregon in a way that you can see it through the kid's eyes. And there's obviously some distance as far as like acknowledging that his perspective is kind of flawed and goofy, but never in a way that feels like it's pandering or like talking down to him is a way that really impressed me. And I think this might be outside of the Pixar films, my favorite Disney production, like three or four years. Oh like my I'm, gosh. I'm not exaggerating when I say I really like this thing. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Winslow Fegley, he's been in some TV stuff before. He was in The Good Doctor, okay. Fast Lane, uh, Teachers. He's had like like smaller roles. Uh, he's like an extra in Rough Night from a few years ago. Uh, but he's going to be showing okay. up in some other movies coming up. He's going to be, uh, I think I don't know if he's going to be like a prominent character, but he's going to be the young version of one of the main characters in Spinning Gold. Uh, so yeah, you'll you'll be seeing a little bit more from this guy. He's uh, he's actually from What's Pennsylvania, a... so uh, Allentown. Okay. That's maybe that's why I like that's why I like <laughs> yeah. stuff. Maybe you like the cut uh, of his jib, huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, like I don't want to give away too much because I think some of it's just the fun surprise factor of it. Like I said, it's on Disney Plus. If you want to check it out. Um, and I don't expect a lot of people to be as warmed up to it as I was. I mean, there's definitely some flaws here. Like I think knowing, I mean, I don't know how the books are presented, but it feels like they're probably a little bit more fragmented. And the the approach to the film, as far as the story execution, can feel a little fragmented as well. To the point where that kind of messes with the pacing and some of the comedic touches of the film. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just think as far as his presentation, clearly having a filmmaker who is like a little bit above your typical pay grade for this and giving us a lot of maturity and wit and uh, style in a way that... You know, it doesn't overshadow the film, doesn't feel like over the top, but clearly it gives it some creative influence in a way that gives it a lot of good personality and heart and humor. Um, Yeah, it's just really solid stuff. And I'm 
definitely surprised to say the least that I enjoyed it as much as I did. But I should never discount Tom McCarthy except for yeah. I guess one time <laughs> when he made the cobbler. But you know, I won't put that against him. And I, I will say for all the cobbler's fault, it does still have Method Man's best performance. So at least there's something in there. Yeah. So did you give this a grade? I uh, no, I didn't. I'm gonna well, I'm gonna a guess it. I'm gonna guess it. I wanna see if oh, I can guess okay. it right. B plus. Uh, I just gave it away. <laughs> yeah. Wait, did you say um, what did yeah, you say? No, yeah, I just I just said it. Well I didn't I didn't hear you say it. I I knew okay. it. I knew it was gonna be a B plus. That is yeah. what you said. It, no, I mean it's one of those, yeah, yeah. Um it's one of those things where it's like I wanna give it an A just because I really enjoyed this and I got a lot out of it, but it's not really like saying anything. Like I feel like an A film has to like have a little bit more of a like social or political relevance. And I think for a lot of people, this is just going to be a pretty casual watch and they're going to enjoy it or not, but it's not really going to like change your lives in one way or another. And I don't think it's going to change mine either. So giving it an A seems a little too hasty, but just in terms of entertainment value and production level and uh, the quality of it, at least, I thought this was really solid stuff. And a B plus seems pretty uh, fair and apt. So I'm going to give it that. Yeah, it, it, it's surprising and it's not surprising at the same time. Like I was a little worried about this because he, he was a co-writer on Nutcracker and the Four Realms. But uh, he was uncredited oh, yeah. on the reshoots. But at the same time, he also worked on Christopher Robin. So I'm like, OK, like, I don't know. His his filmography is a little bit back and forth. Right. And I also was like, OK, I want to see this because while Sean is in it, like there, there was just stuff oh, about yeah, this. Great. The the budget mm-hmm. is like forty two million dollars. It's like, OK, so the clearly yeah. like effort was, went into yeah. this. So I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, happy it's to see it. like Yeah, it's refreshing to see like a mid budget, like a directly mid budget film from Disney. I think that was also yeah. another factor I found really refreshing is that like, you know, like we see so many movies from now where, I mean, I didn't see Togo, but um, like most of them are like, you know, like definitely Togo was very good. expensive. Yeah. I remember you liked it, but I mean, like a lot of the ones I associate from Disney recently have been like very like high budget, you know, like reshoot or reboots or whatever remakes of like higher films and they like, all are like $300 million productions and stuff like that. It's just nice to see like a film like this where it's just fairly casual, a lot smaller stakes but it has a lot of personality and wit and it's it's just nice i wish they would fund more movies like this but actually put them in theaters but i'm well, going to accept them nonetheless yeah it's it's funny because i think disney is sort of taking a note from netflix but then also avoiding something that netflix has had issues with and that's like netflix has been pouring just tons and tons of money into these films that should be mid budget that are being made for mm-hmm. way too much right and so right. People, people are going to Netflix to have their movies made because Netflix will spend like or give them will give them more money or allow them to spend more money. And that seems like I was listening to the Hollywood Read podcast with Sarah Mars and Kelly Donaldson, and they were talking about this on their most recent episode. And it's very true. Like Sarah Mars was talking about how like this tap, as she called it, is going to run out soon. And if you're going to be doing these mid budget films and they don't grow your your service exponentially, like people right. aren't going on Netflix to watch uh, I think the example she used was The Irishman, and it's not going to be winning a lot of Oscars. I mean, knock on wood. Who knows if it's going to tonight, but it doesn't seem like yeah. it's going to win much. And Netflix is like running in the situation where they're just letting filmmakers spend like hundreds of millions of dollars on these big movies. And I think Disney's doing something sort of different with this movie in Togo. And it seems like it's trending toward we're going to put mid budget films in here. It's going to kind of, I guess, shoulder this service it's it's going to keep people subscribed and that's good enough for them it's not going to be the thing that drives subscriptions it's going to be something that just sustains their ip generation and their 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 library i suppose so it's an interesting business plan i think that timmy failure could be a good sign but yeah i agree that yeah unless you were at sundance you weren't able to actually watch this on the big screen the people who did see it on the big screen they really liked it too this has an 85 percent on rotten tomatoes out of 20 reviews most of those being sundance and everything i heard like at the festival from people who saw i was like yeah i actually liked it it was like surprisingly good so yeah it's a little it's a little bit of a shame that this isn't the kind of movie that's like the big february success story it's just sort of something that some people are going to catch on disney plus and hopefully like it yeah i mean and i hope you know at least somebody is convinced to watch it from what i say but yeah i mean it just feels like you know because like there's a once upon a time where like something like max keeble's big move uh, and to be clear, Timmy Failure is a little better than Max Keeble's big move, but like that would be given like a pretty sizable theatrical window yeah. and, you know, would play. How times have changed. And like, and that would just like Max Keeble would just be on Disney Plus with little to no fanfare now if that came out today. And, you know, maybe that's better for the or maybe it's for the worst. I don't know. But like just something like this, like it, 
it feels like it's kind of giving the cold shoulder in some respects from Disney. And I, I don't feel that that's fair uh, for a number of reasons. But I mean, like I said, they are funding them and, you know, they did. They put the money in to make this a reality and, you know, they, they let Tom McCarthy do his thing with this and I have to respect that in some regards. So, yeah, yeah, it's enjoyable. But I, I do find myself a little disheartened to know that movies like this, if they're not like big $300 million productions, are probably going to almost certainly be just thrown onto their streaming service with little to no fanfare, which, which sucks. But that's the way they, things are right now, it seems. I think if Disney's smart, they're going to start like for these movies they're going to like begin each one with like some music and some kids jumping. And it's going to be like, let's watch a Disney plus movie. That's how you're going to get subscriptions cashing out at a speed they've never even seen. That's what's going to make it happen. Okay. So I forgot you did not grow up with cable. So you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's right true. Now. <laughs> so. Maybe someone. Does. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I'm referencing Disney channel, original movies and it's a jingle and it's really important to people okay. in my generation and, Yours too, Will, but I guess we are the same generation. Well, are you talking about? I thought what, I thought their thing was like the like film reel though come and like the kids will like jump out of that's, it. That's that's what I'm talking about. And as okay. the kids are jumping out of it, it, the music goes. Let's watch a Disney Channel movie. It's not the same as when you have the wand and you're like, hey, you know, like I'm Hillary Duff. Like you're yeah, watching, and you're Disney, watching Channel. Disney Channel. Yeah, it's not that, but that's a well, good idea I would too. Say, you're watching yeah. Disney Plus. I just want. Yeah, I, well, but just get like the like most random people from it. Like get Wallace Shawn to do that. Like Hayden Christensen. Hi, I'm Wall. Yeah, hey, I'm Wallace Shawn, and you're watching Disney Plus. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ahsoka Tano, and you're watching yeah. Disney Plus. <laughs> hey, it's Willem Dafoe here, <laughs> and you're watching Disney Plus. It's just Togo just barking, right? <laughs> Subtitles though. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of Cinemaholics. Thanks, as always, for listening. We'll see you on the main show again next week for all kinds of reviews. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about, um, what's the big wide release? The Photograph. Sonic? Sonic the Hedgehog and Fantasy Island. Uh, I'm going to be seeing The Photograph on Wednesday, and I guess I'll be okay. seeing Sonic the Hedgehog on Thursday. I don't know if I'm going to have time to catch Fantasy Island, Will Ashen. What about you? Um, I have a screening for Downhill. I know you talked about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that as well. That hits limited release this weekend. Okay. And then, does Call of the Wild come out this weekend? I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, well, I did see um, To All the Boys I Love Before, too. So I can talk about that next week. Um, I guess I thought Absolutely, that came out this weekend, yeah. but I guess it come out, that comes out next week, I guess. I think that's the 21st for Valentine's Day. is when that comes out. And then I, Call of the Wild I, I see right here 12th. is February 21st. I think uh, Two Old Boys is the 12th because it comes out before Valentine's Day. Uh, that's probably true. Cool. All right. Well, we'll see you next week for all those movies and maybe more. Uh, from the Internet California, I'm John Negroni. And from the Internet Pennsylvania, I'm Lashin. See you next time. The joke's on you.